Um, so this is what we're going to go over today. First, we'll, we'll start with, uh, I'll present a piece on an overview of the new user cohort method, uh, cohort method design, large scale propensity scores and outcome models. And then Mark will take us through an exercise about dissecting a published cohort study. Take a break for a while, and then I'll present again on um, on a walkthrough of implementing a cohort study in uh, in Atlas. That's the software that you all have access to through this link. Afterwards, uh, Martine will take you through what's underneath the hood in Atlas and show you the code that it generates as you point and click through the user interface and exactly what that's doing. Uh, and then we'll have another break. This will be followed by Patrick, and we'll all do a study live uh, together. And then Mark will wrap up with what exactly, you know, the, the extent of what we've accomplished in just one day. Um, it says presentation, but, you know, interrupt me and let's talk about things as, as I go through them. I'll probably, um, you know, l I'd love to hear your interpretations of some of the things I say and please ask questions as we go. I really don't want to just be the only one talking for an hour, so. <laughs> um, okay, so this is an overview of new user, uh, new user, uh, cohort method design. We're going to talk about large-scale propensity scores that are used to balance the cohorts in this group and then uh, outcome models. So as we heard a lot of yesterday, um, we're here to empower one another to generate evidence needed to support health decisions, which is part of Odyssey's mission. And um, you know, the CDM and the standardized tools were all created not as an end in themselves, but as a mean to create reliable evidence. And, if, and, and because of all of this, we're working to like remove data structure and content and analysis and evaluation and even to some, some extent investigator variability in asking uh, the same question of multiple sources around the world. So like the common data model and this software that we're going to go through, the idea is that it's a single standardized pipeline to generate consistent answers across different sources. Um, Odyssey seeks to create evidence in three domains, or three, three general buckets. Um, you can think of clinical characterization, like what has actually happened to patients. You can think of the natural history, what are, like, who are the patients that have diabetes, and among those patients, who takes metformin? Or quality improvement, like what proportion of patients with diabetes experience complications? Um, this is, this is just what is observed. There's population level effect estimation, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, and this encompasses things like safety surveillance, whether metformin specifically causes lactic acidosis, and comparative effectiveness, and does metformin uh, you know, cause a safety or an effectiveness outcome more or less than another, another ingredient. And then a third type of evidence that Odyssey uh, seeks to create is uh, patient level prediction. And this um, is about precision medicine. And given everything you know about a single person, um, if I start taking a particular drug, uh, what's the probability that this will, that some event will happen to me going forward? And this is used in like disease interception applications. Um, like what's the chance that I'll develop this? And of course, today we're gonna focus um, intensely on population level effect estimation, causal inference studies. Um, in order to generate reliable evidence, there are these three uh, main approaches. There's a methodological research component, such as developing new approaches for observational data analysis, evaluating the performance of new and existing methods, and establishing empirically based best practices for doing this. Um, once this methods, once the methods research actually develops um, tools, they are then encoded by our highly talented developers in this open source analytics development piece where um, they design tools for data transformation and standardization, implementing statistical methods for large scale analytics, and then building um, easy ways to interact with um, evidence and all the steps in the evidence generation pipeline through visualizations and easy to use tools. And then lastly, there's clinical evidence generation, which Patrick spoke to in the wrap-up of the symposium yesterday. It's once the, the CDM, once these methodological uh, approaches are, are confirmed to be good and they've been put into development so they can be used, then we turn this on and actually create the evidence that patients need 
to make decisions about their health going forward. And that includes, you know, identifying the appropriate questions to ask. Yes? Um, just a question. Um, so I know that with the, um, with the last session yesterday, we had PACAC, and they have all these certain protocols on the big hub. Um, is the assumption with the package you have your own connection details to whatever data warehouse you're using, but also the computing power is not as that you have a lot of core and a lot of cluster um, power at your fingertips is that kind of weird. So in other words, you can't really do a lot of these different protocols on your local laptop. Assumption that you have connections to multiple cores. The, 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 first, the first assumption to all of it is that you, there's access to a, you have access to data that's been transformed into the common data model. And that itself is, is a you know, resource intensive step. Once you've done it, um, uh, the, the first time takes forever and it's hard. But once you, once you kind of get the hang of it, it becomes a little easier to do. But yes, the idea that, that um, you know, anyone on earth can access these tools is true. Anyone on Earth cannot just go and perform one of these studies because you need to have access to data. And like you say, computational power is 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 important if you're doing large scale analytics. So like you can you you can definitely run these tools on um, publicly available publicly available um, synthetic data that has been produced, and you can run it on the power of your laptop. But you cannot run Legend on your laptop without access to to, to data. Does, does that does that answer your question? Thanks. Um, but yeah, so like this clinical evidence generation piece um, starts from like identifying, identifying the questions like Jenna did yesterday, stood up and just and crowdsourced it basically, found one and by the end of the day had actually produced evidence on this question. Um, execute studies by applying the best practices that have been encoded in the tools and these other two steps and then to promote open science strategies for transparent study design and evidence dissemination. And I, I like to think of these things on a matrix. Not everybody does, but you can imagine that the types of evidence that are created, like clinical characterization, population level fact estimation, and patient level prediction, each require a component of these three of these three approaches. So there's like a methodological research and open source development piece, and then a clinical ev gen uh, evidence generation piece for each of these types of evidence. And um, Today, we are going to be focusing on this one. We are clearly right in this corner. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, you know, the methods research that got to the population level effect estimation package, and like some we're gonna be using the tools that have been developed in this, uh, in this center, center cell, but we are going to be focused on how you use these tools to generate clinical evidence in this area. Um, so like Odyssey has, um, come up with, well, maybe it's not just Odyssey. There is a standardized process for evidence generation and dissemination, and Odyssey is doing its best to try to standardize this as much as possible. Um, start with a question, whether, and then that question is reviewed to see whether it's been covered before, whether, um, whether evidence already exists on this question or related questions. Um, need to then think about how to design design a study that accurately answers that question, publish a protocol, and at that point, give that protocol to the world so that you're not tempted to you know, do something different later in order to get a better p-value, which Martin talks about frequently as p-hacking. And then once this is all done and published, you execute your study and synthesize your results. And um, at each step of the way, Odyssey is trying to do this. It regularly is um, like, uh, crowdsourcing questions from the community. If you've spent any time on the um, on the on the Odyssey uh, forms, on the message forms, you'll see people are asking clinical questions all the time and trying to figure out what the best way is to answer questions that imp that's important to uh, to patients. Um, there's the uh, open source open source knowledge base called the um, called SEM, which used to be called Larities, and SEM is now the Martine, what does SEM stand for again now? It's the SEM, Old Larities. 
Common evidence Common model. Evidence. Yes. So the, so the current, the current open source knowledge base is once you've asked your clinical question, you can actually look through the common evidence model to see what has been, what knowledge currently exists on that question and where it is, the, where the gap is that you're trying to fill with your question. Um, you can then design your study using the open source front end web applications like Atlas that we're going to use today. It's a very powerful tool to take an idea from one, one that's just in your head to actually to, to putting it out in a systematic way into code to ask it of your database. Um, and then underneath the hood, when you execute your study that you've designed using these tools, underneath the hood are the statistical packages. Uh, and there's an, a complete methods suite of these as, as R libraries. And we're going to be going through cohort method today. And then lastly, you can synthesize these results. And thanks to, thanks to the common data model and the, and the vast Odyssey network, you can ask your question not only of your own data, but on any other database in the network. OK. Do you have any questions about why, why, we're, why we're here and what Odyssey is doing in this sort of area? No. OK. Um, so what population level effect estimation is doing is trying to answer, it's trying to identify causal relationships in observational data. And you can kind of think, you can think of, um, of causality using counterfactual reasoning. Counterfactual reasoning is something everybody does all the time and have been doing it since we were kids, but sometimes you don't really, or I'll speak for myself, sometimes I didn't, don't even notice that I'm doing it when I do. And like, uh, like my 16-month my son does this. He like, I, can, like he's, I can see him thinking to himself, he's like, had I not pointed and shrieked at that tennis ball, someone would not have brought it to me. You know, and I know that he, he, it's in his head, he's like, if I don't do this, I'll never get the ball. You know, so like, there's this, there's this if I don't actually do this, something different will happen than if I do do it and get the object. And then like in, in school, I tend to think like, had I studied more for that exam, I would have done better. There's this idea of if something different had happened, then a different outcome would have happened. And I'm making this connection that there's a, a cause between them. Later on in like college, had I not gone to that party, I wouldn't have this headache. Um, is another good one. Or had I not got that LASIK procedure, maybe my depth perception wouldn't have been, have been screwed up. So like there are a lot of these examples of, of thinking counterfactually to land at a conclusion of what causes something else. I'm pretty sure this is unique to humans. You know, the dog doesn't do it. My dog runs and barks at the mailman and I know the dog is not thinking, if I didn't do this, the mailman will like come in and kill everyone. He just thinks that, you know, the dog hates the mailman, he's gonna get him every time. Doesn't think about what would happen if he didn't try to get him. So it's, it's just us. But um, it's all about considering an outcome under like an alternative scenario that didn't happen. And that alternative scenario and like which scenario is taken when you're, when you're thinking about counterfactuals, it always involves a choice at a very specific point in time. And it's at that point in time that, it's at that point in time when, um, you know, you've gone down one route and you're not going to be able to identify the counterfactual route. So here's a little pop culture reference that I've, you know, lifted from a colleague of mine. This is Keanu Reeves in an old 90s movie called, uh, called The Matrix. And Keanu is living a horrible life as a programmer in a dark room when Morpheus comes along and gives them this choice. You know, it's like take the red pill or the blue pill. And I can't remember which is which, but one of them will take him to this like the matrix and it's this incredible realistic future where he gets to be a hero and the other one is that he gets to stay in his cave and, and program computers. Um, and he decides to take the red pill. So I suppose the red pill is the matrix and, and off he goes. So like it's at this point in time that um, that the, the counterfactual approach has, has gone on. So, does anyone know what this guy what this guy is? It's a it's it's a really really badly rendered 8-bit hockey player from a Nintendo game. 
back in, back in, the, back in the, I think it was from the 80s. But what's interesting about these characters is in this hockey game, there are three different types of characters. There's a medium guy, a big guy, and a little guy. So we'll, we'll get that becomes relevant later. But if you want to think about counterfactual reasoning for one person, we'll call this guy Keanu that we were just looking at. He goes along in time and gets to a decision point. He's going to take either the red or the blue pill. And um, this guy decides that he will take the red pill. And then off he goes, carrying on through time. And some sort of outcome happens to him. And thinking counterfactually, in order to determine the cause of the red or blue pill, we would really want to go back in time using our little spaceship, the DeLorean, and give this same person, Keanu, the, uh, the blue pill and see what happens and see what happens to him. And then the idea is because you know the two counterfactual outcomes that happen on, on each side of this uh, decision, you can make some sort of claim to the individual causality. We could say for this hockey player named Koana, Keanu, taking the red pill makes him happy and taking the blue pill makes him sad. And um, you can think of all the time before that decision as a, as a baseline period where you would learn things about Keanu and then the times af all the time after the, uh, the, the zero point as the follow-up period where you're actually looking for these outcomes. You can similarly think of this in a, uh, in a group of people. It doesn't have to be uh, just one person at a time. Um, oh, yeah, mm, I, I should have explained, unless it's not clear, that the horizontal line represents time, and time is progressing as, as you move left to, left to right across this. Um, but yes, and determining causality in a single person is not possible because you know, we don't have the time machine. Um, you can think of counterfactual, counterfactual reasoning in a population. So rather than just a single person, you can move all these guys along. And the first person goes and gets sick, and this person is oh, happy, happy, sad. They go back and do it all again. And what happens is this would give you, this would give you a, a summary data set. You would know, you would be able to say, this medium hockey player, uh, when given both of the pills in these counterfactual situations, uh, their outcome under the red pill is happy and under the blue pill is sad. And same with this uh, skinny guy in the middle, you kind of, you know what the outcome would be in this hypothetical situation. You know what their outcome would be in uh, both situations, but you know this is not possible because we don't have we don't have the DeLorean. So we established earlier that establishing causality for a single person using counterfactual reasoning is impossible. Um, but there is a large body of work that shows that establishing average causality in a population is actually doable. And this is when you hear things like average treatment effect. That's what's what they're getting at. So instead of studying a single population in two counterfactual situations that's impossible, we can define one population and then randomly assign the red or the blue to each of these, to each of the two groups, and then compare the outcomes between them. Um, so what you do is you, uh, you, know, you randomize your people, you flip a coin, and you, decide, and you see whether they end up taking the red or the blue. So if we randomly flip these guys, the medium hockey player, I think that's Keanu, gets red, the middle guy gets red, and then the big guy gets blue. And this creates a similar data set to before, except it now has gaps in it. And um, we, we don't know what the person's counterfactual um, outcome would be because they're only ever exposed to one of these treatments. But this idea of randomization, it allows for the assumption that people assigned to either of the two groups are exchangeable with people that are, ex or, or sorry, people that are assigned to one group are exchangeable with people that are assigned to the other. And the idea is that there should be no difference between that person at, the, between people getting the different treatment options at that decision point. Um, it's difficult to visualize with just three people here, but with a sufficiently large population of people that you randomize to one or the other group, the distribution of characteristics that make up the group in total ends up 
evenly distributed between the two groups. So in, in this example, the distribution of small, medium, and large hockey players would be pretty close to the same in both of the groups. And in that case is when you can compare the average outcome occurrence between these balanced groups where the only difference between them on average is the, is the red or the blue pill, you can actually get, uh, get closer to an average causal effect of the treatment in that population, in that particular population. Yes? Um, so I guess you can think, well, what I'm thinking about it, can, but for one of the three people in this example, they have taken either the red pill only, the blue pill only, or they have taken both. So do you do the randomization and the Yeah, so in, in, the, in the context of randomization, provided you have enough people to randomize to the, to, to the two groups, a really nice property of randomization is then, on average, the distribution ends up the same in, in both groups. And there's a really nice and intuitive uh, discussion and proof for this written in Paul Rosenbaum's book. It's called Design of Observational Studies. And it's really quite amazing how you just like, with a pretty simple, a chart not much more complicated than this, we'll walk you through how it actually mathematically works out that the balance is, you know, ends up the same. It's, it's fun, I, I, I recommend it. Uh, I mean, you, in, in the, in like uh, the context of a pharmaceutical clinical trial, I think you get, just get to do it once. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is an important point, right? In any given randomized controlled trial, we only have a finite and generally small number of individuals. So even though you're flipping a coin and it's, say, 50-50, with that finite number of individuals, you still can have a small bit, or you will have a small bit of imbalance between the treated and the non-treated group because of sampling issues. Okay? But on average, if you were to repeat this trial many, many, many times, or an infinite number of times, they would be exactly balanced. So it's because of this idea that if we were to repeat the trial, that we can rely on standard constructions of, say, confidence intervals and statements about differences under this resampling hypothesis. Yeah, you would have to. Yeah, we don't get to do that. So one thing that, that people, that is generally done in a randomized controlled trial is even your outcome model, you might look at the distribution of, of fatties and skinny individuals, and you might then say, well, we tried to randomize, we did a good job, we weren't completely balanced, let's include that term as an extra, a linear correction in our model where we look at you know, do they get a smiley face or not? To do a small bit of adjustment for the misbalance that they observe because it's just a finite, small population. It's a great questions. Any other questions before we go on? So you can't always do a randomized study. We all know this. You can. You can't. Sometimes it's you can't uh, ethically, uh, you know, design a randomized trial. An example is you might, you might do harm, uh, you might inadvertently do harm if you expose pregnant women to this or that, um, to this or that intervention. So there are often clinical trials that use uh, on a pregnant population are often not done for ethical reasons. Often you can't afford it. Like Patrick was speaking yesterday about the $100 million, you need to do the study, but it's hard to come by that, that kind of money. And often, sometimes it just takes too long. People need answers sooner than, than four years. So, the, so given that we can't um, you know, create a true counterfactual, because we don't have the time machine, and in the case where we can't do a randomized trial because of ethical or cost or time reasons, we can 
approach this from an observational standpoint. And uh, to do that, we would define, specifically define a larger population, observe what treatment choices were made, that were already made in the past, we're no longer thinking prospectively, but retrospectively, and then compare, um, and then compare outcomes. And these um, treatment choices can be made between people who made different choices. So that's sort of like our hockey players. We had a bunch of hockey players. Some took one, some took the other. Or there's another way where you can compare the treatment choices in the same person, but just at different periods of time in their, uh, in their recorded medical history. Um, we're here to talk about the comparative cohort design that's going to uh, answer questions about between two groups, where does the event happen, in whom does the uh, event happen more often, rather than self-control designs where that answer questions like when, when it happens relative to treatment exposures. Um, oh dear, so there are a lot of different ways to, uh, <laughs> to define comparative cohort study, and they're all in these different textbooks, and we are not gonna read them all, but um, it essentially, com I don't know, Com it essentially looks, defines a larger population, decide, uh, you look to see in that larger population which people have made one choice or the other, or their doctors made the choice for them, or were basically exposed in some way or another to one versus another group, and then you, uh, in some period of time following the decision that put the person into that particular group measurement, follow it and, um, and measure the event occurrence. Um, so if we, rather than reading all of these textbook definitions, we can look at our hockey players again. And um, so it's a way to um, approximate counterfactual outcomes. So here, instead of there being a coin toss in front of all of these people, what we see is that all these yellow guys on the left have um, taken this red pill, and all these red guys on the right have taken the blue pill, and then we see what their outcomes are because you only observe one, one of their outcomes, the one that was observed. You don't get to see their other one. Um, I like to think of this stuff in rectangular data frames. I don't know if you do either, but it ends up that, it ends up that um, our little data set looks like this, and you've got a group of people that have made one choice, and you know what their outcome is in that choice under that choice, and then you have another group of people that have taken another choice, and you know what their outcome is under that choice, but you're missing, for each of these two groups, you're missing the counterfactual. So it, it, it's the exchangeability assumption that, that at some point, you know, the, the, at the point of the decision, the two people would be exchangeable. It's, um, it looks like there's, there's a reason for that choice. It's not, they're no longer exchangeable. It's not like one or the other is taking it by chance alone. In this case, it's clearly because, you know, one team is from the Soviet Union and the other's not. And it's probably more likely that uh, one group is getting one drug for a reason other than, other than chance alone. Does anyone have any, any questions? Mark, you got anything to add? I don't, but let me rephrase Jamie's question and say, all right, give Jamie two questions. <laughs> Who's got the first one? Yes. Um, sorry, so you just briefly mentioned that you can't do uh, your trials and all that stuff. I really struggle. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll speak up. So you said you can do a lot of your trials or um, by course or um, special publishers that and women or children, and so on. So how do you, yeah, so how do you put, so if you want to estimate some kind of causality for, uh, within the cell population, what approach do you usually take? To, to answer causal questions in, in, in vulnerable, vulnerable populations, yeah. you have to cleverly design observational studies like this that account for obvious um, selection problems, and um, it's it's tricky. So I hear we assume that there are some representative people in the cohort, but you know, it's small compared to the large population, and you take that into account. Yes. All right. Yeah, I mean that's that's a really important 
direction of research is how do we account for that selection or the ascertainment process and how that ascertainment process varies from population to population. I mean, particularly, you know, particularly when that population is, is relatively small compared to the, 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 the you know, a whole country or a whole database that we have. Um, and we're, we're really interested in, in doing research in this direction with good, with, with great applications. Um, my is pretty accurate. I, I do have a question. So, in a large cohort setting, as we have experienced, you get pretty good propensity matching, all based on characteristics and well balance. But we have observed that in a reasonable sample size situation, even we use a pretty good propensity model, we fail to match and all based on characteristics balance. So I've been thinking about how do we address it, right? So one way it's just like we did that we do the typical multivariable analysis of the propensity matching, almost as you mentioned earlier, even in the clinical trial setting, with some based on characteristics not being balanced, uh, is that one way is we including additional, those not balanced covariates into the model, if the distribution is reasonable still in the two cohort, into the additional after propensity matching, include them in the model to further adjust, that's one way. And the second thing, well obviously, one doing the multi-million comparison, like my time doing, that become challenging because you have to identify those imbalance for every individual comparison to adjust them, right? And the second approach that I'm thinking is that the additional approach with negative control as Mark China and Patrick have been using could be another way is that even there is a systematic bias or error, potential imbalance reduced in the situation when you're using the negative control they may channel in the same direction for whatever reason, but maybe due to the baseline balance or measure confounding factors. If we use those further calibration, is that another way to address the issue? So with those two approaches, or maybe you have other approach, what's your thought about that, even if the propensity matching is not satisfactory to some sort of number, limited number variable, even large number variable, obviously, you would be very hesitating to draw anything to further, right? But if only with a limited number of covariates, and could be thinking, could be important. So what's the best way to address those? I mean, using a, a suite of diagnostic tests for any, for any question is probably the preferred approach because you, know, you might balance well on all of your observed covariates and you will see good propensity score balancing, but you might be, a, but your you know, negative control outcomes might show otherwise, suggesting that there's unmeasured confounding. So I think for any case using the suite of diagnostics to evaluate to evaluate the, the exchangeability criteria is probably probably what I would recommend. You have anything to add, Mark or Martine? I mean it's an important it, it's it's a very important point. You know quite often there will be additional factors on which on which you're not balanced. Um, and the standard approach up to now has been well assume a linear adjustment for that and hope for the best. Um, with or without the linear adjustment, you still have this, bu this bias in your effect estimate. You know, what's the relative rate that you get happy faces versus not happy faces? Which is just another form, as you mentioned, of, of systematic error. Um, so one could use negative controls as an approach to learn about what the distribution of systematic error is in there. Systematic error comes from many different sources. Here, we come from the inability to construct absolutely comparable populations. Yeah, but I mean, on the... But, but you're, asking, you're asking, what should one do? Yeah. I mean, why, from you, you why not try both? <coughs> yeah. For individual study, especially with a limited comparison, I can even think of a look at those covariates, even though in the baseline, because those are exposure baseline, right? Yeah. Even they're in balance, if they're not associated with outcome, it's really not an issue. Right. But, but in the individual study, you have the luxury to go in and invest them. Yeah. But in the situation like in, you do in, hundreds in, in, of thousands in, in, of them. In an automated setting, that's it's right. much more challenging that's to, right. to make that expert judgment. That, that's exactly. So if you want to continue to do the automated hundreds of thousands comparisons of what would be general approach to address it, I think that I just remains the open question to me because that question, even in one of the EMA studies, we talk about in the study protocol, we say in the situation when, when the propensity matching is not satisfactory, then we may 
put a caveat to the hop to reinterpret result, actually, yeah, they argued, say, in the situation where it's not valid, you should put in those baseline covers into the model. We argued because we have multiple hundred stuff, that could be become a challenge for individual ones. So we said that's introducing multi layers in terms of how the sum and result cross comparison, the different things. So we didn't take that approach eventually, we pushed back and yet accept it. But, but that question lingers, right? I keep thinking about it. So that's why I thought if in the automated situation, whether there's a systematic way we address it, then eventually if there is a way that would be great. If there's not, then probably have to continue to think about it. So I can turn the question around is, okay, in the automated way, what do we do? I mean, you're very familiar with the tool stack and the, and the studies. Yeah, I, that's why I was thinking negative up to, control. Yeah, up to now, we've been using negative control. Yeah, that, so could be, that could be one way. But I don't know, anecdotally, whether that totally addressed that imbalanced question. I don't know. Yeah. Unless you showed anecdotal evidence, say, yes, that's satisfactorily addressed. And then the other ways, we do have to look at a few examples, say, maybe those based on characteristics not associated with outcome is not a major concern. Right. Obviously, if you try to in, include the individual covariance in the model, in the automated hundred thousand of them, because they're all different based on the different ones, could be, uh, because the individually matched propensity score for every individual parallel comparison, that could be challenging. That's why, I, well, I personally, I think that may not be the best way to move forward, but I don't, I don't have an answer to it, just thinking about it. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, well, I don't, because, I mean, it, so, we can think about what the theoretical answer is, and in practice, empirically, what happens. Empirically, um, is easy, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. Theoretically, we have a large number of negative controls. And there's no reason, necessarily, to assume that this, the same association between whatever is misbalanced in my two cohorts has the same direction or magnitude of association with the negative controls. Matter of fact, you might make the assumption, and I think a counter argument against our techniques would make this assumption, that since you're assuming that they're negative controls, there's no association with not only exposure, but we might as well also assume that there's no association with the factors that are mis misbalanced. Under that theoretical argument, you're not going to be able to adjust for the additional, for the residual bias that having that misbalance is, is, is going to have there. But that's under the very strict assumption that your negative controls do are not associated with whatever the factor is, being, you know, being a fatty versus being a skinny. Um, emp empirically, we don't know if that's true or not. So I think it's a, it's, it's a very nice empirical question to, yeah. to address. Well, I, as you were describing it, I think it probably would not be true, right? Because now I'm thinking, Negative controls tend to identify systematic errors. So therefore, I would expect that it goes in one direction most time, most uh, uh, negative control. But in the, the individual situation, if they truly associate with outcome, in particular that setting, I would think that bias actually towards direction is probably not the same as negative control. I saw that Martin shaking his head. Because he, <laughs> well, like, it's not all in the same direction. Maybe, maybe we're going a little bit too yeah. deep into the nuts and bolts of negative okay. controls here. Let's, yeah. let's yeah. move on. So let's step back and let's remind, remember that let's not get stuck in these thought experiments because those are purely theoretical. Generally, what's more important is what happens in here. Yeah. Um, so we, we were talking about in observational settings, balance is a problem. There are often reasons for why one group receives the red pill rather than one group receiving the other pill. And these are the types of things that if you were to go and um, measure the occurrence of outcomes or worse, compare the occurrence of outcomes between these groups that for different reasons have received different treatments, you get bad answers. You get worse than no answers. You get a biased answer and it's, and it's just wrong. So there are methods to um, try to balance these two groups and one is called the propensity score. Everyone here, who is familiar with propensity scores? Every, many people, not everybody, okay. Um, so the propensity score is um, the estimated, I'll just repeat this directly from the original paper on the stuff, is the estimated, the estimated propensity, exposure propensity score is the conditional probability of being assigned to a particular treatment given a vector of observed covariates. So this little um, equation that we're looking here is that the propensity score is on the left, 
and it's the probability of receiving z, which you can think of as one of the, the red pill or the blue pill, probability of receiving z given everything you know about a patient. That x is the vector of all the patient characteristics that you have on record in their, in their file. Uh, it's the probability of, of belonging to a target versus comparator cohort, and the probability, and you can use the propensity score as, as a balancing score. It's like a univariate measure that, um, that says the likelihood of a, th that a patient will be in one group rather than the other. And sometimes this aligns with which group they're actually in, and other times it doesn't. The idea, though, is that um, if two people or hockey players or subjects or whatever with um, similar propensity scores, it means that they are likely to have a similar distribution of baseline covariates. So, on, so you can think that people with a similar propensity score might be alike. They might be closer to exchangeable. Um, yes, Sigrid. It's just that it's just uh, yeah no no real reason. It's just what Don Rubin picked. Don Rubin picked. Don Rubin picked in the '80s. Oh, okay. They, they they don't actually stand for something short. Uh, but they are conventional. They're not random. Uh, they are conventional, okay. but yeah, but irrelevant. There are other conventions where like all confounders are L. I'm like why? No, no one knows. Um, so the you can. You can, once, once you take a population of people that have received one treatment or the other, and you can fit, you fit a propensity score model, the fitted, the, the, the fitted values that you get from this, from this uh, model, logistic regression usually, you, yes? Right, yeah, that's, a, that's an old article. Um, if, so in, in defining who goes into the propensity score, in the first place, you might want to think about whether patients, uh, you know, in the treatment and the comparator cohort both share the same ind indication. Like, sometimes if you're, if you're looking at a hypertensive treatment, everybody's likely to have hypertension. So, like, the, that's balanced as you go into the problem. In other situations, though, that might not be the case. And you sometimes need to decide which covariates go into your propensity score model um, in relation to how you've defined your cohorts. Like if you can't include in your model, in your propensity score model, co covariates that are used to define your cohorts in the first place, because then you will perfectly split your propensity scores and you, know, there's, you don't get any information from that. That uh, help? Yeah. Okay. So, like, when you, uh, after you, for everyone in your population, when you uh, produce a propensity score for them, it's it's uh, helpful to visualize the propensity score distributions between the uh, people that have been exposed to the red or the blue pill. And this plot here is a way that you can look to see how similar or different your two groups are on this univariate measure. So um, who's familiar with these plots? We looked at a couple of them yesterday. Oh, how many again? <laughs> he knows. <laughs> Millions of them. But um, the idea here is that the patients in this overlap, this um, section where the, uh, this triangular space between the blue and the dashed red line those are patients that are likely to be most similar with each, to each other. Whereas when you go to the extremes of, the, of these uh, curves, you end up seeing the people on the far left are patients that are most likely to be um, assigned the comparison drug and in fact have uh, never been exposed to the, are not, and, and no proportion of these patients have been exposed to the blue pill. And then the same goes on the other side. So it's this area in the middle where patients are you know, more likely to be exchangeable, and they're the ones that you might want to compare for outcome occurrence in the two groups. Um, here are some theoretical advantages to using propensity scores in PharmEpi. Um, 
Here's, here's your, uh, your question. <laughs> yes, Siegfried. Of course. Okay. So it's not uh, study and comparator, it's study and, and not study. The, the two, we're, we're getting a propensity for... It's the, it's, it's the so propensity... Question, no, no, yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the probability of, being a, of having been exposed to one of your two treatment levels. This assumes two treatment levels. A choice has been made and one group has Sorry. is the legend on the bottom says what you're saying, but the legend on the top says a different thing that I that The so. people on the the people in this shaded area on the left have have a a uh, very low propensity to have been exposed to the study drug, the blue one. And in fact, these ones in the shaded area, not a single one of those people with a propensity score from 0 to 0.25, no one with a propensity score of 0 to 0.25 has been exposed to the, to the study drug. The so I think where the confusion here is that the plot was taken from the Schneeweiss paper, and they used the term study drug and comparative drug although both of them are included in the study. And so we use tart. the term target drug and comparative drug just to indicate both of these treatments are in the study. So maybe that's your confusion. Yeah. No, and, some, and part, of, no, part of the confusion is uh, Sebastian's also missing conditional statements on the top. It's not patients never treated. It's patients who we predict would never be. Well, those patients on the left with propensity scores of 0 to 0.25 have not been treated because none of, there's, there, there are zero. Yeah, 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 but that's an artifact. So, so okay. I think you have to think about your, your original choice, either treatment or not treatment, so blue pill or, or red pill. This is like blue pill, red pill, right? So, so the, one of the treatments may be normal treatment, not being treated at all. The, or it could be treated by another drug, right? So it's always a decision. So right now you're looking at a decision of, of one drug versus another drug or one drug versus nothing. This should, we've mostly been talking about one drug against another one, right? And yes. does this reflect that or does this reflect it one drug be. against nothing? It could be either. I think, right. I think you have to take a step back, think about logistic regression. What logistic regression does that, that model will assign the probability for receiving a treatment for score for everybody. So at the end of the day, every individual will have prob probability score, for example, receiving a target drug. But even if you got a probability in that situation, 0.2 probability receive that drug, you may not receive it in the comparator arm, but you receive the other drug. So in that situation, that probability is the same. So when you imagine them in that situation, say, even though your probability of receiving that target drug is identical either on the low end or high end, you very likely receive, you didn't receive, or you not that very likely receive, you didn't receive. On that basis, those two individuals are really similar. So in that situation, when you match them up, that becomes pseudo-randomized setting. So you, you can't receive the target drug if you didn't, therefore that becomes two individuals become Sorry, only I, random. Maybe my I, th I think what you're asking is too simple for yeah. people to understand. It's just, we've got two groups. Let, let me try and ask okay. what I think you're asking. What I think you're asking is, are we always comparing two drugs, or can you compare a drug to no drug? No, no. Okay. I'm asking about this slide. So we've got treated with a study drug, treated with a comparative drug. Those are our two groups. You have a propensity to be in one or the other. Right. On the top of those bars, it only talks about the study drug. It doesn't talk about the comparator drug. So if the comparator were no drug, then I would be confused. But we're not thinking about the comparator no. being no drug. No. So we're only, so the things on the top only talk about the study, not about the comparator. You, you, could, you could, instead of saying patients always treated with study drug, you could say patients never treated with comparator drug. Okay, then I would know that there wasn't a mistake in that. Okay, got it. So Thank you. everyone has a propensity score. Um, 
everyone has been exposed to one drug or the other, but there are areas on the distribution where th there's no overlap between the propensity score and the people who have actually been observed to have been in the one or the other. And that's what those shaded areas are showing. That was totally the answer. talk about outcomes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, any other questions about this, about this plot? It's an important one. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked the question to, to get clear on it. It really, this is, this is one of the main diagnostics for determining whether we can actually compare outcome occurrence between two groups. And if these plots were spread way apart, it is you know, a sign that you should, you should uh, ask your question in a different, you know, ask, answer your question using a different approach. They're all on. They're all on the internet. <laughs> George said, "No, I, I'll, these will be online, like later today. You can get it wherever, or you can go to the paper. The paper is a good one in pharmacoepidemiology and drug safety." Yes. So, just in case there's anyone who didn't understand what I was saying, I think those headings on the top should be only on the left. It should be the only patients exposed to the comparative drug, and on the right, it should be. Only patients exposed to the study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are at one hour, so I'm going to try to hustle through some of this stuff. Here are a variety of reasons to, uh, to use the propensity score. It has theoretical advantages. It deals with confounding by indication, as, as you asked. Uh, you can eliminate those uncomparable groups, those, those um, the, the people that we see in the fringes of the distribution that have no exposure to one or are always exposed to one, you don't want them in your comparison. So you can trim patients on the basis of the propensity score to only make your comparisons between folks that are closer to exchangeable. Um, it allows for matching on a single value rather than trying to do some great big multivariate model that uh, requires many degrees of freedom. Um, and you can look for treatment her heterogeneity across, uh, across different levels of probability of exposure. Um, the cohort method package that we're going to be using later today um, allows for you to use the propensity score in three main ways. There's a, one way to use it is not recommended, which is just using a, your, the propensity score as a covariate in an outcome model. But um, cohort method is uh, specified to allow for matching on the propensity score. You can, once you have a propensity score for all your patients, you can find those that are within some range of each other and then match those patients and make comparisons between them. You can stratify on the propensity score, which basically uh, creates a pooled estimate of the um, 
across groups of similar people. And then lastly, and a new addition, is that you can use inverse probability of treatment weighting, which is where you take the inverse of the propensity score and use that as a weight for each person in your outcome model. Um, so we can visualize some of these things, like matching on the propensity score as you find your medium-sized hockey players and your large hockey players and your skinny hockey players, and then you only do your analysis on them. So for example, now our cohort summary is we have um, the red, the red pill people, you've got a, a hockey player of each size, and the blue, you have a hockey player of each size. Stratification is where you uh, look for your, you create an outcome model in uh, among the large people uh, only, among the medium people only, and then among the small people only, and you pool your effect across that. Um, so you could get these three little summaries. Um, so this is a, a, a nice method for trying to establish causality using observational data, but as um, Patrick and Martine's paper here concludes, this is a nice paper on the empirical evaluation of this method. So there's a lot of, um, I've talked through some of the intuition and theory behind using propensity scores uh, to do cohort studies, but like how does it actually perform? Well, these guys, uh, created a bunch of simulated data in a million different scenarios and actually tested to see how well it does on a variety of performance metrics. And they concluded that this is a good method and it can contribute useful information towards a safety and risk identification system, but it um, shouldn't be considered definitive um, because there's definitely error involved in some of it and you should be careful in um, carefully consider what your comparators are. If you're interested in looking at the effect of some uh, intervention on some outcome, the comparator is a, is a lot of the story. Like what, what your basis of comparison is really is the crux of what um, you're gonna get. So that you need to be yeah, careful. Add to that, so one of, one of the things that uh, you have to choose is your target and your comparator. And so there are, in, in a clinical trial setting, often your comparator is placebo, there's no treatment. So people are very tempted to do the same thing when they do an observational study. And that almost always goes wrong. For a very simple reason is how do you find the people that are not treated? I mean, you have to somehow select them in a way that they're comparable to your target group at a point in time that's comparable to your target group, but you have nothing to anchor that on. So in general, my rule of thumb is picking a non-exposed uh, Comparator group is a bad idea. So you can do it, but then you have to think really carefully on how you're going to construct that comparator group. In general, it is better to compare two treatments for the same indication because that way, at least already at the get go, they're somewhat comparable in that they have the same underlying disease that's being treated. And you're looking at that at the same time, which is when they initiate such a treatment. Yeah. 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 Or so negative control is something completely different. I don't know, do we have a separate section or are we doing that? I don't think, I don't think we do, but we, I think we should talk, try to find some time today to talk about it, because it's come up a few times and it's, it's critical. Yeah, so, so negative control is not a non-exposed group. Yeah, it's not a but like this, this choice of comparator is critical. It's like the choice of comparator is the whole story. You know, when someone says like, wow, that's expensive. It's like, well, compared to what? You know, like it, by itself, it's nothing. It's only, in, like the, the, the effect is only, like, rel only as meaningful as what it is you're comparing it to. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, time is looking not great, so I'm gonna try and go through this quickly. Um, we, we've spoken about uh, trying to determine much more important to get okay. <laughs> All right. So, so far, uh, we've, we've thought about um, counterfactual reasoning. We've thought about how you can, how you can, how you cannot get to counterfactual, you can't use counterfactual reasoning to establish causality in individuals. But you can do it in, uh, in groups of people. And the best way to do that, or a way to do that, that is expensive and sometimes unethical, and sometimes ethical, is using a clinical, is using a randomization. In some cases, you can't do that, and this is where we find ourselves in observational research, trying to establish causal inferences using observational studies. And we've looked at ways to take two groups of people that have had to make a choice um, towards one approach or the other, and you can only do one, there's no time machine, um, 
And then we've spoken about propensity scores that are a way to try to make these uh, two groups balanced in a way that you can uh, make a valid comparison for the outcome occurrence between the two. Um, but how do you actually define the people that go into your study in the first place? And this is where we get to thinking about cohorts. Um, the Odyssey definition of cohort is a straightforward one, and it's intuitive and nice um, at first. Then it can get a little complicated. But we call it like a set of persons who satisfy one or more inclusion criteria for a, du for a duration of time. And um, that, that means that people enter a cohort, and people can exit a cohort. Cohorts can have zero people in them. If, you, if your rules are such that nobody in your population matches them, then that's fine. You have a cohort definition, and you just have zero people in it. Um, it means that one person can belong to multiple cohorts. One person may belong to the same cohort, but at multiple different time periods. Uh, one person cannot belong to the same cohort multiple times during the same time period. Um, and like I said, a cohort can have no people. You can create the most restrictive cohort on Earth and no one's in it. Um, but a code set is not a cohort. A code set is just a, just, uh, you know, a current, it's not even an occurrence. A code set is just a bunch of information that is used to populate a database. A cohort is when you use that information in relation to time to figure out who satisfies those criteria. Um, yeah. So the process flow for formally defining a cohort in ATLAS, ATLAS is the tool that we're going to be using this afternoon, is that you start by thinking about an initial event, something that must have happened to consider a person for membership in a cohort. And these are recorded and time-stamped observations for, for members of your database or population. And this can include things like drug exposures, condition occurrences, procedures, measurements, or visits, or any, any type of event that can happen to somebody that is recorded in your electronic database. Um, all the events have a start and an end date, although some of these events just have, you know, the start and end date is the same date. Like uh, the granularity of data in many CDMs is, is by the day. So if you have a procedure as your initial event, that uh, starts and ends on the same day. Um, once you, have, once you have defined your initial, like the initial criteria for getting into the cohort, you can add additional qualifying uh, inclusion criteria. So say you're not only interested in new users of um, an SGLT2I inhibitor, but you want to make sure that new users of this drug have had a diagnosis for type 2 diabetes, but not type 1 diabetes in the year or so beforehand. So you've started, your initial event is that you've got new use of this drug, but you want to make sure that the people are using this drug for a particular condition, so you include this qualifying criteria to then restrict your initial event down to um, the more accurate population that you're looking for. And as you add these additional inclusion criteria to your initial event, you can, you can um, assess the impact of each of these, um, the, each of these criteria and see how many people from your initial cohort are actually lost for each subsequent um, criteria that you add. Um, you can get quite granular with this stuff. You can um, you know, create very, very uh, specific groups of people with a lot of uh, complex inclusion criteria to really zero in on, on specific populations that could be of interest. It's, it's amazing, and you can just point and click through this. We'll, we'll have some fun with this later. Um, a database, a CDM. How many of you have access to a, to a CDM on a regular basis, like at your job? Oh man, just a few. Yeah, I know, that's not many. Yeah, well, that I know, do. Okay. Pardon? Synthetic CDM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, so this square we can think of as a, as a database or a population, and in, this, and in this population or in this database, there are all sorts of uh, cohorts. There's new users of this drug, new users of that drug, and then there's intersection and between them and something else, and it, it can really fill up with, you can define cohorts in every way under the sun. And um, there's a, 
intersection of new users of C and F, new users of a device, there's often overlap. Here are these people that are new users of A and B had an incident condition one. Sometimes they're all the same people, et cetera. Um, so the key inputs to a comparative cohort study are a target cohort and a comparator cohort. In many cases, you want a lot of the definitions of your target and cohort, uh, your target and cohort can, uh, definition to be the same other than that choice that it is you're interested in. So you don't want to compare people that had some sort of procedure for one condition to a group that had some sort of medication for some other condition. That's not going to be a good group. What you often want to do is take a, a group of patients that have experienced this one condition and define both the T and C cohort by that, but then add the specification that they are exposed to one or the other treatment for that condition. So in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, you want a lot of your cohort definition criteria for your T and C to be the same. Um, then there is an outcome cohort definition. You want to identify the people that have had the outcome that you're interested in. And what's, what's nice about the cohort method framework is that you define your outcome cohort independently from your target and comparator cohort. There's a lot of, or at least the way I was, I was trained, was to not really think like that. You ju only think of your target and your comparator, and then some of them have had an outcome and then some of them haven't. But the cohort method software is designed in this really nice modular way where T, C's, and O's are own, their own independent entity, and then it's later that the people that have experienced the O, whether or not they land in the time at risk that you define later, that's how they get put into the, into the pipeline. So it's, it's nice that your O definition is not dependent on anything in the TNC. So that's, I don't, I don't know, that's, that was new to me when I, when I learned the software. And then... So, so one advantage of that is that we can reuse our outcome definitions over studies. Like we have one stroke definition that we use in multiple studies, a my, myocardial uh, cohort definition that we just reuse. Uh, and just plug that into every study and well, and, the, and there's one stroke cohort, and like there's yeah. one stroke cohort in your database, and it really just, and depending on what your T and C definition is, and when people enter that stroke cohort, they may or may not be part of your particular study, but that same cohort is just there, and it exists, and you don't have to redo it dependent on, you know, some study-specific context. And this, you know, this this is important in that, like, you decide your definition for what, what how to find someone with a stroke, and then it doesn't change based on whether you're looking at, I don't know, SGLT2s or antihypertensive drugs or whatever. Yes? So what if your outcome, instead of being a yes or no, is an A, B, or C? Do people ever do that? I mean, is that just not the way people think about epidemiology? Do you have an example of an A, B, C outcome? Um, uh, Stage of Sure. Uh, well, so, so, no, people typically, typically don't have outcomes that have A, B, C. What, what I would probably do in, in a situation like stages is I would define them as separate, separate outcomes. outcomes. And each of them are compared against the negative of themselves. I mean, each of yes. them, you just need to... Yeah. I guess I don't understand the outcome at all. So you have two cohorts, right? The target cohort and comparative cohort. So the outcome is just a variable. It's one zero variable, right? No, like so that for that two, two cohorts, right? You have a hectrotonic it, it, it eventually becomes. It eventually becomes a one or a zero in a rectangular data set. But in terms of how you actually define people that have had the outcome, it is definitely not just a one or a zero. It has the same. Um, it you, defining your outcome cohort is the same as defining your T or C cohort. You need an initial event criteria. You need to know why somebody would have had that outcome. Is it a condition occurrence? Does that code exist in the database? Has it been there twice to confirm that it's not a rule out code? Do they have enough follow up afterwards to be able to confirm? Like there are all sorts of rules to, to define people that have had the outcome just the same way that you have rules to define who is in the T or the C. And, that, and doing this independent, like in this modular way is, 
is one of the benefits of this of this software. Okay. It eventually becomes. Okay, so it's just like it's background uh, software for uh, definition, right? And then you are fixing, you map your uh, your particular uh, Yeah. So, so what the software will do is it will look at, for example, your target cohort and will see, oh, people are in this target cohort for this amount of time and maybe you find a, a time at risk that, that stops at the end of exposure and then it will think, what have you done? That was off with his head. Don't worry. <laughs> for that specific risk window, it will then check whether there are outcomes that are actually within that window. So the software will then do that for you and we'll turn that into a variable in your data set that says this person had the outcome during that specific risk window. Then you may do another may do another analysis where you define your risk window in a different way and then the software will again check what well, didn't fall in that window and so the variable might check to be changed on a lot of options. So when you're designing one of these studies you think about your target cohort, your comparative cohort, and your outcome cohort independently of the target and comparator cohort, which is unique and very and turns out to be really useful. And then a time at risk, you know, the time during which somebody that has entered the target and comparator cohort, you want to look for outcome occurrences. And then your model specification, your outcome model. Yes? The outcome is defined with respect to an index date though, that's uh, generated by the target and comparator cohort criteria. The, the index date the initial event date of the outcome cohort is not defined relative to the to the index date of the TNC. It's, de, it's, it's determined independently of that, and it's only later once you've once you've decided what your T and your C and your O are, and you feed it into the software, that's when it looks to see whether the initial event date of the outcome cohort falls within the time at risk after the index date of the T or the C. So to, to your uh, question, or to your comment a second ago, you can think of this as um, you know, intersecting, intersecting uh, Venn diagrams like, like so. Like you can think of there's your T and there's your C. There's some overlap between them. Some people are in both. Do you want to conclude them in your analysis or do you want to get rid of them? And then after you do your propensity score matching, for example, you will have fewer people than you started with in your initial T and your C cohorts. You've trimmed some people off the end. You've determined that some people's propensity scores are such that they don't have a good match in the other side. So you end up with this T and C, T prime and C prime cohorts that will end up being the basis for your comparing outcome occurrence. And then this O as something independent of the T and C, all of a sudden, You've defined that, and you have this set of people that have experienced the outcome, but it's only those outcomes in the T prime and C prime that will be the basis for your comparison later. And this is, I, I like this plot because it's a nice way to visualize this modular structure, and it helps with this idea that the O is independent of the T and the C until you get down to the analysis. Yeah, there it is. That's the, so those are, the, those are your events, and when you have your event count, however many people are in those two spots where the arrows are pointing are the, uh, are the event comparison. Um, lastly, there's a, you know, the outcome model defines your study. Are you um, looking for like the presence of, a, of, a, of an event during some fixed period? Are you looking at counts or are you looking at time to event? And depending on, uh, depending on the, the question at hand, you would decide whether to use a logistic or a Poisson or a Cox proportional hazards model. And then they each have their own set of assumptions, basically proportionality and Cox models and the fixed window for, for logistic regression. Um, I think just to, to wrap up, this is a paper written by Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins that are pushing the idea that you should design observational studies the way that you would design a trial. And uh, this was covered yesterday in the plenary talk that um, you want to try to, to do that. And, and what goes into a trial, you think about eligibility criteria and treatment strategies, assignment procedures like you know, coin flipping or, and follow-up periods. These are all, you can have analogous, um, you know, these are analog concepts that have, an, that have analogs in observational settings. Like eligibility criteria is your, is your cohort definition. 
and um, you know your follow-up period might be you know how long you are in that cohort and um, you know in an analysis plan there's there are, there are analogs to it and you want to try to emulate it as much as possible and that's what cohort method is trying to do um, so we looked at this earlier this is the standardized method to uh, to uh, create evidence and disseminate it and um, I'll just go through this quickly. There's what questions being asked and what's your motivation? What decision is, is the evidence you create going to support? Is it gonna support patient decisions, uh, provider positions, policy decisions? There, there are all sorts of, uh, all sorts of uh, evidence gaps from different levels that, that need addressing. Uh, what already exists? Literature reviews help with this. Uh, how to go about designing your study, and there's a lot of work and thought that should go into such a thing and should, once it's agreed upon, you stop and you publish it and you give it to everybody else and you say this is what we're going to publish and you know, if you're going to amend it, you only do that very, very, very carefully and hopefully not after you've looked at your result because that could uh, you know, compromise your integrity. Um, you run the thing using the best practices that are encoded in this like, software stack that we've got and then you synthesize your results and figure out the best way to put it into action. Sometimes that's publishing a paper, sometimes that's writing a, making a, a web app that anybody can use and uh, you know, we need, want some creative answers to find other ways to create impact from this stuff because we definitely know that scientific papers are, are a good source of information but they're probably underutilized. And then a lot of this information can be uh, just put directly into your publication. So, yeah, that's it. And when we're designing our own studies, uh, cohort method studies, you just think of how to define your T, your C, your O, your time at risk, and what your outcome model is. And, um, and that's it.